Hope does research and marketing. She's at the uh, University of Arizona. Uh, she's uh, <coughs> also an associate dean there at the University of Arizona. She, again, she's a very sort of distinguished, high science scholar in uh, in marketing. One of her areas of work is sort of uh, how consumers mess around with all sorts of innovations in terms of campaigns, uh, in terms of creating campaigns and movements and also more recently in terms of wearable technologies, in terms of how wearable technologies are changing how what consumers do and how we learn from them and how we work. Again, a very neat title of this presentation here, you know, When We Make Magic, Collaborative Innovation and Value Creation. So thanks, Luke. Um, so thank you so much for inviting me. I know Leyland and Ian and Ed that might be why I got invited, because I'm pretty excited about it. This is a beautiful city. Uh, but just in case you've never been to Tucson, Arizona, and you think that it's just a desert out there, we have a proper university with brick buildings and some greenery. <laughs> and I just want you to be aware of that. You know, you can always come and visit us. Uh, we do some, some cool stuff over there. Um, so my chair is actually in entrepreneurship and innovation, so I guess this could also fit. Um, Thank heavens, because I got to come and visit with you. And the weather that you gave me was amazing. So thank you for that. Ian, I assume that was your doing? Excellent. Well done. Um, so I want you to think about the we part and the magic part. And then the collaborative and the innovation and the value creation will kind of follow. So I'm going to try to tell a story to you. Um, so first, we have this idea of consumption. And almost all of our theories about consumption are built upon individual actors. So we look at psychology, sure there's social psychology, but most of our, most of our theories are built in, in psychology being sort of an independent thing. Economics with a rational man or woman, and they overwhelmingly assume that she is acting alone. But most of consumption happens together. So we consume inside families, we consume inside our colleagues, we consume with communities, friends, neighbors. I'm a Red Hot Chili Peppers fan, and I can tell you it's always better when you listen together. So uh, <laughs> that's just something that we think about. And it's, it's sort of an anomaly, if you will, that we focus on the individual rational person when consumption is collective and irrational, right? So hopefully we can start thinking about that. So if this is David right here, and he's part of a family, and then he goes to work, and he has a fitness community, and a hobby, and a neighborhood that he lives in, then all of these we's are helping to contribute to why he's consuming and how he consumes. So it's kind of odd, and I would say uh, truly odd, that we look, we look at David. What is David doing, and why is David doing it? Well, David's acting in a whole bunch of networks, and we tend not to, not to pay attention to those. So let's think about ways in which the we plays out in things we all think about. So the we's are in memberships. Back in the day, we were really interested in libraries. Now we can access it from anywhere. But there used to be the library card. And that was kind of your ticket to whether you were a scholar or a nerd. You know, your nerd badge was your uh, library card. Um, gyms, golf courses, all of these things depend on us owning a piece of something that we can't actually tangibilize. We also have co-ops in terms of food. Um, I did babysitting co-ops. We called it um, child sharing. And so you know, we would have um, some parent, all of us worked, and so some parents would come and meet the children at the bus stop, and that was your afternoon to pay attention to these uh, children and their uh, constituent activities, which there were many. Um, education, very much a co-op in some places. Uh, if you know Melanie Wallendorf, who's a professor at the University of Arizona, um, she did all co-op education for her children. So that is a very um, interesting uh, way to do things and it's super cool. I, I was not that cool. I sent them to public schools, but uh, oh. Melanie far cooler than I. Um, and then this kind of idea here, integrative touch for kids, is looking at medical um, communities and looking at a child with disabilities or um, health challenges and considering that they're part of a family and part of a community and all of those things need to be impacted in order for the child to succeed. So if we think in terms of that, then it, it kind of makes sense that we have zip cars now and auto sharing, bike sharing and cloud storage. It all makes sense if we consider that everything is really collaborative. 
And I heard a very charming story the other night that Leyland told um, about uh, John giving him a hard drive. And I was like, oh my god, how 1995, right? <laughs> like a hard drive, as if it mattered, right? Because everything that we access is someplace that we can't actually touch. So if we think about that, then it kind of dates ourselves when we tell those stories, Leyland. I'm just saying. A little bit 1995 there. No problem. I'm here to keep you real. Uh, <laughs> So if we think in terms of Sprint, they're already doing this with the multi-device plans, multi-user plans. They already know that this is based on collectives and access. And I think this one actually might be our best case, our best practice. And that's Netflix. They have multi-device plans, multi-user plans, co-viewing, simultaneous viewing, friend algos, and embedded social commentary. Have you guys used any of the embedded social commentary? Fantastic. Let me tell you just for two seconds how, how cool that is. Can I? Okay. So, um, you don't get any of this stuff? Except that this one is on a beta test, so it depends on who you are, what region you're in, and all that, but it's pretty amazing stuff. So, I'm a, a hardcore Sons of Anarchy fan. Okay, so if you are too, um, yeah. And if you aren't, it's, a, it's about bikers. Um, but it's kind of like if Game of Thrones were set in bikers. I think it's kind of like that. So it's like good and evil, a prince who will be heir, and what will happen. And I watch it with my son who now lives in Los Angeles. And he puts a commentary, or I put a commentary. Oh, remember this guy used to be in such and such. Or, ooh, what do you think will happen here? It pops up. Think pop-up video, if you've ever seen that back in the day. Um, and while he's watching it, he sees my comments. I see his comments. And then when my daughter views it later on, she sees both of our comments. And she can comment too. It gives me an alert that she's commented. Really cool stuff. Um, I'm trying to get my mom involved in this, and she's not quite there yet, but this is pretty different. It means that, that this social television is, um, is definitely a reality for Netflix, and they're investing in it. So if we think about that, then what we're kind of looking at is that there's a collective collaborative consumption practice. It's prevalent, and it's qualitatively different than what we did before. Me watching the show on my own, very different from me watching my show with, uh, with my children. Um, collaborative consumption also leads to value creation. It is something different when I see their comments than when I watched it alone. There's some value added to that. Um, and it's ultimately collaborative. And I would argue that our big goal as marketers, as people in this market space, as people in society, is to harness this collaboration for a positive pro-social aspect. So let's kind of think about what the we in value creativity does. Um, some of you may know Steve Vargo and Bob Lush, um, amazing people. They started talking about service dominant logic, which would mean that value isn't created in, say, a manufacturing warehouse, where it just sort of sits there and waits for something to happen, but that the value is actually when we take that, that chair and we put it in this room and we sit in it and then we have some kind of academic discourse, then that value of the chair is actually manifest. Um, if we think about that, then sort of the stuff that we've been working on with brand communities as sites of value creation works, um, the creative consumers work, we heard about, um, about that from Karen, really cool um, presentation on that today. And that's kind of where I'm um, going to try to situate us here. So when we think about we, we think about places like Threadless, so places where, um, if you haven't seen it, uh, it's kind of a has-been now, but uh, Naked and Angry is taking over, which is another one of their companies. And so this is where they have community submits a design, the community scores the design, they talk about it, vet it, the ones that are most positively vetted are produced. Um, pretty cool, right? Pretty cool business model. Um, just like crowdfunding is pretty cool. And we talked a little bit about how big pharma is actually getting in this too, and mitigating risk by having uh, researchers all over the world trying to solve problems that otherwise they would have to bear the risk of all these things. So it's pretty cool stuff happening here. Um, and then I've been working a lot with Al Munez on Lego, and we have a, a, colony, a col colleague, Yun Min, and she actually worked at Lego for a long time and works again at Lego. And do you know, does anyone know this story? I know those of us who talk about this probably know, but are you familiar with some of this stuff? So there's the adult fans of Lego who produce an Indiana Jones playset, um, MacGyvered, if you will, out of uh, their own um, imagination. Um, Lego hears about it, creates the Indiana Jones playset. I mean, I'm, I'm paraphrasing and simplifying, but it went something like this. 
And then Sony Pictures gets involved and says, oh my goodness, we should have another Indiana Jones uh, movie. Uh, movie is, is made, Harrison Ford is dusted off, Shia LaBeouf is put in, um, new, set of, new generation starts to like this show. Um, they create a video game and it's in its third um, permutation. So we see that these people effectively created value and changed a value proposition for a branded object. And I'm not going to show you this, but if I do, because I want to get to something else, but if you haven't seen it, you should probably check it out. It's kind of cool. Um, this is a Wii case. It's uh, Igniting Puma. Does anyone know about the hard chorus? No? Okay, so there was a problem. I'm just going to give you the, the two-second version of this, two-minute version. A problem, and that is that one of the big football matches is going to occur on Valentine's Day. Uh, these fans are going to be away. Um, it's kind of gendered in that the fans are presumed to be male, and maybe that is true. And the um, angry um, semi-significant significant others are female. And they're like, you want to be at this game, you should be with me. And so Puma comes in with this solution, and that's this hard chorus. They sing this song, which was a song by um, Savage Garden, which I find that name very interesting because they're ni neither Savage nor Garden, but that's cool. Um, and it was Truly Madly Deeply, which is the song. And so these, uh, these soccer fans uh, sing the song, and it is viewed on, t on their computer screens. Uh, they create it, they disseminate it, they send it to their loved ones. All manner of crazy stuff is enacted. Uh, first and foremost, Puma, who is in a very competitive space, becomes a market leader in this space. Um, the next thing that happens is Sound Garden, or Savage Garden becomes uh, relevant again, if you will. Um, their song uh, goes on to trend, so we see all kinds of, of good things that happen from that. In addition to that, 72 videos were made in parody or in um, synergy with them. It depends on, on our version of parody, where they sing the song and they send it to a loved one, and it has something to do with Puma, and so all things are good here. Um, but it does beg the question that could this work with financial institutions? So I would have to say that this same sort of thing does work in financial institutions. And I work a lot with credit unions. I'm a, a Filene Fellow, which is their um, think tank. Filene is a think tank for credit unions. And through imagining and prompting people to imagine uh, collaborative financial instruments, we've come up with real estate mortgages that are multifamily, multi-member, multi-generational. Renovation plans, multifamily, multi-member, multi-generational. Same thing with college funds, savings account, auto loans. Imagine fleets instead of uh, imagining that I'm going to pay my son's very high, just because he's you know, young, um, insurance and all that. But what if it's all bundled together? The rates are different. Um, good stuff happening. Um, it also means that you can pass down from one generation to another wealth um, without taxation. So some, some good stuff um, happening in this space. So I just want you to say it, it can happen for Lego, uh, it can happen for Puma, it can happen in financial services. So now I'm going to tell you about the data set we're looking at here. So I'm looking at fitness forums and six medical forums. So we're going to think about monitoring devices or wearables that monitor something. And these wearables could be for fitness only or for medical purposes. Um, so we uh, did interviews with 18 people who use fitness monitors, uh, 12 medical condition monitor users, four medical doctors, six level, mid-level uh, medical people who use this, um, five NICU families, which was 26 members in total. And we observed at one fitness center um, three NICU and one medical condition site. There's a lot of data. Um, I want to give a little shout out to um, my student, Beth Defoe, who uh, is working primarily on the NICU part of the project. And she is uh, amazing. She'll be on the market next year. More to come on that. Um, <laughs> little plug for her. She's quite amazing. And also John Scouten at Alto University in Finland, who helped uh, get us entree to NICU in Finland. Really nice things going on there. So, if we think in terms of what people imagine goes on with medical objectification, then there's this idea that um, we create patients, we dehumanize them, we objectify them, and if we think in terms of what Foucault said in Birth of a Clinic, then we can really see that what happens in medical spaces to people is their personhood is taken away, and instead they're put in a gown and they're made to feel like an object. And in the middle of this, there's these clinics that take you away liminal space from your family. There's visiting hours of which families can visit 
only sometimes, depending on which families and depending on what kinds of marriage are um, acknowledged in a given society, uh, there's some controls on that. And then there's this power chasm, the information flow and the decision making, I am an expert, say if I'm the doctor, and you are not. And so this is kind of what people imagine, and this happened, it, it's a bracketed moment in time, and I'd like you to imagine that, that before that, medicine happened in your home, um, it happened with people who were practitioners that you knew all your life, and then there was the scientization, which is what Foucault talks about. In addition to that, there's also this idea of technology and surveillance, that a body is an object that has little or no agency, it's a specimen, um, there's control, suspicious, nefarious motives that might occur, and all of this is how people imagine these monitoring technologies uh, exist. And what ends up happening is that we see some of that happen and some of it not. So these are Google Glass. Has anyone tried these? And what are they used for? Huh? Being a geek. Being a geek, OK. There's being a geek. Um, what else are they used for? Voyeurism. <laughs> yes, because you can take a picture by blinking your eyes, and so no one would notice that. But what's really interesting is that the Braille Institute has tweaked this technology to allow people with low vision to have improved vision. So when they, um, when they uh, estimate that the lighting is of your particular sensitivity, they will turn up the light with Google Glass on the part, the lens in which you see. Um, if you have a problem like macular degeneration and you cannot see the center, they will um, mirror it out so that you can see. So Google Glass, which didn't, wasn't created to do that, is inside the community of people who consider low vision in the Braille Institute, actually technology to let people see. So it becomes not a game, but an actual um, monitoring device that then helps you see. Uh, the same could be said of fitness. Uh, so when we created the idea, when, when Beth and I were working on trying to figure out what is a wearable that's fitness and what is medical, it bleeds a lot. So I just want that to be clear. Uh, people wear some of these devices. I have the old-fashioned Nike uh, one, and that's because I'm invested in this community, and there's a switching cost that I'm not willing to do yet. Um, so I, I have a set of people that I compare run notes with, and we, we do things, and I'm afraid to leave that community, which might be for some of the reasons we're talking about here. But these are some of the newer devices. Um, some of our research echoes a lot of other research that has happened that said that between 21 to 66 days of wearing a monitor, you will get compliance. So that means that if you abandon somewhere in there, you will not get compliance. So if it's new and novel and fun, you may be complying in the beginning and then over time if you abandon before that habit sets in, uh, you're not one of the people that uh, it sticks with. So these are kinds of things to think about. Um, but what's also interesting is that these fitness monitors actually change the way people think about their bodies. And that is a finding that we want to really focus on in terms of population health and those kinds of concerns. Um, there's, a, there's an unrealistic expectation that people have who don't wear monitors about so fitness, say, or weight loss. They imagine that you could lose weight in a week that will be removed completely from your life. Um, that's interesting because that's really water weight and as soon as you drink water it will come back. Um, so yeah their knowledge uh, you know it's it, they want to believe. It's not that they're not clever because they're very clever but they want to believe that they can lose 10 pounds in one week and this will be a sustainable thing that they can keep forever. And what happens when you wear these monitors you find out that that's not true. That's not true because you are now, you are monitoring yourself and you are able to see if you share with others what other people do and you're able to figure out that, hey, if I lose five pounds in a month and I keep it off, then that might be sustainable, but not in one week. So in essence, by monitoring, we actually learn more and better things about how our bodies work, which is pretty cool. Um, here's some, some examples from the compliance end that we had, uh, Signa. 42, she says, there are, are definitely days where I say I'm tired and I don't have time to run today, but then I think about the people I share my data with. They'll know I was lazy or think that I'm ill. I'm not afraid of my friends and family being mean. I'm afraid of letting them down. I'm afraid of not being who I want to be. So these kinds of communities that share practices, um, they change people's behaviors 
and they change people's understandings of success. So uh, she's not afraid that they'll say, you're fat and lazy, but she's afraid that she doesn't see herself as fat and lazy, and that if they see herself as fat and lazy, she will somehow become fat and lazy. These are things that she's concerned about. Um, Todd, 47, he says, I run for myself. I'm not big on what other people think, but these are the people I trust. We keep each other honest. So he does care about what some people think. But you know, it's interesting because when you talk to Todd, he doesn't care at all about what fitness gurus are saying or Dr. Oz or any of those people. He, he, it matters not at all. But it matters a great deal what his friends and fellow people who he's been training with for several years think. That matters a lot. So here's another idea about better regimes. So they comply to the regimes that, they're, that they've committed to, but they also come up with better regimes. So Ted says, we're all training for the marathon. My group shares diet, training, run day, rituals. They help, stuff I wouldn't have thought of, and I'd not have tried some stranger's advice. So if he had read it in Runner's Magazine, he may or may not be influenced, but when it really influences him is when his running buddies say it. Uh, Mindy, 34, I was getting so dehydrated, nothing seemed to work. My group had ideas, good ones. I'm doing a lot better staying hydrated, which improves my performance. So she wasn't thinking about hydration until she started monitoring. Then she started talking to other people, and then her regimes get better. So she used to faint or run um, to the point of um, a breakdown, I guess they call it, where she actually falls at the end of her run. And uh, now she's able to run through the tape and, and continue on. Uh, Megan, she says, I'm trying to lose weight. Having advice I can trust from people committed to helping me achieve that goal is precious. They know what is realistic given my kids and my job. So instead of telling her a regime she knows that she can never, ever do, these people are giving her real advice. Like, I know you have a two-year-old. I know that this is your life. You can't get up at 5 o'clock and run. Somebody's got to watch this, this baby. This is advice for you. So what ends up happening is these we fitness regimes uh, change and people take on uh, new and better activities. So let's switch and think a little bit about the medical monitors. So medical monitors could be like these skin ones, which are really non-invasive. They could be more invasive like this. Um, and then they could be what I would call extremely invasive, which is the NICU. Um, so in the case of this, I guess all the patients and patient families uh, expressed initial apprehension at this kind of wearable. They were concerned. Um, and then over time, they developed a keen appreciation. So one thing that really changed is they had less visits to the hospital, the place that is scientized and potentially fear-provoking, and they're doing more of these things from home. So they're able to monitor their insulin, send in their reports. Doctors are able to see it in real time. In terms of the babies, they're able to change the practices that might then change the technologies later on. So if we can kind of imagine the presentations we had about patents, these kinds of great ideas are created in a space that's all about the science. What's the best way to do this? How can I make it small? But you know what, what is missing in that is what that science actually looks like when it's lived. So when we think about all of the things that could make a baby happier and more productive and life intensive, like full of life, um, we might imagine that they can wear all kinds of things. So I will uh, confess that I had a baby that was um, very similar to this. Uh, she was connected to a lot of machinery. And when you have a baby like that, it's a huge thing. We'll talk about how, how different that is from the baby you imagine having. And what the doctors imagined we could do as a collective unit is very different. They've never done this with a child. This is all the science, right? So it's like, oh, yeah, you need to do this, and you need to monitor that. And it's like, you need to wake the baby up every day. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? Um, when will we sleep? When will we eat? If I follow your regime, we will do nothing else, right? And that's like, oh, but that's the best way to do it. I don't know. They haven't thought about what the lived experience is. And what I'm suggesting is that maybe some of these kind of monitors would give them a better sense of what the lived experience is. So we get more accurate data streams, not people who say, oh yeah, I check my insulin, and I do my insulin on the dot every time. I'm so good. And then if you look at the data stream, you're like, not really. No, not so much. Or our baby, we actually, uh, when uh, my daughter had this problem, we would say, oh, she alarms like 16 times a day. We don't know what to do with it. We kind of wake her up and jostle her. She then breathes. We think this is okay. you know. And the doctor's like, oh, yeah, she breathed. 
not a big deal. What about the root cause? Like, what is going on those 16 times that we could do something different about? Doctor was not terribly interested in that. You know, that, I'll tell you, it's frightening. If you've ever, anyone here had a baby like that? It is, it's terrifying. Babies that are predictable, you know, in your mind, this is what I'm going to have, and then you have one of these, and you're like, okay. This is really different. Um, but I would suggest that some of these things, while they look kind of scary, um, they actually make the product conversations with doctors more productive because we're not talking about what I remember doing or I, what I want you to think I did, but what I actually did. This is what actually happened. And it gives people more sense of agency too. So here's another wearable um, that helps with medical stuff. This is an external muscle. Has anyone ever seen these? Um, so uh, people who are stroke victims or whatnot may not have the same um, muscular ability that they once had, and they're able to wear some of these packs, and within a given range, now that range is, is pretty narrow, they're able to let this machine help with some of that. Um, this is one that also increases the ability to hear, and when they increase the ability to hear, you think, oh, that's just like every other... Um, hearing aid, but this one actually lets you, by clicking your jaw, say which conversation you're most interested in, and then it will click into that one and you can hear that better. So we're talking about some really cool stuff happening here. Um, whereas many hearing aids amplify everything and all the ambient noise goes. So some of these things could be used for athletic performance, um, but many of them are used mostly for um, medical purposes. So here's an example uh, that a doctor told us. He said, as a doctor, I spend an average of 12 minutes with a patient per visit. This is not enough time to get to know the patient, who they are, what they do. Sure, over time, I get to know some of the patients, and probably those are the sicker ones, right? Um, but that's a small percentage. With the wearables, the patients share their data on a secure site. We track together. They diary, too, so they also diary to help with this. We compare successful cases, find better regimes, get better compliance. This is far better than relying on the results of tests I chose based on 12 minutes together. The best healthcare outcomes are collaborative. So if you're a doctor and you have 12 minutes with somebody and you have to think during the 12 minutes, what's the most likely test? What's the test that's going to give me an answer to what's going on here? It's a huge art. And some doctors are saying that now that they're moving to these other collaborative spaces, they're able to get real-time data and really solve problems in a more effective way. So here's um, what I was talking about. When you have a baby, um, this, is, this is what you imagine is going to happen. You're pregnant and you imagine you're going to have this beautiful pink baby or fill in the color of whatever baby you imagined you were going to have. And, um, and that's... I, I don't know the parentage of this child, but you imagine it's going to be healthy, breathing, it's going to live in, within the family, and then this is what happens. And there's no template for that. Nobody told you that this was going to happen. You have no idea. And so what they um, sort of, um, what, how they kind of tell you this is they sort of give you this context that this baby is science's baby. Right, this, is, this, this baby is, is ours. We'll tell you how to treat it, and you can hold it during special hours where we're there, and we can kind of give you some kinds of uh, understanding of what's going on, but we don't tell you too much because you wouldn't understand. Okay, this is kind of, and if you think about that, that's a really scary place to be. And in some health communities, they call it welcome to Holland. So um, this is kind of cute. They say, you're going to have a baby. It's like planning a fabulous vacation trip to Italy. It's very exciting. After months of eager anticipation, the day finally arrives. You pack your bags. You're off. You go. The stewardess says, welcome to Holland. You're like, Holland? What do you mean Holland? I was signed up for Italy. I'm supposed to be in Italy. <laughs> so you <laughs> imagined this, and this is what you got, and it is a very different thing. Why did they come home? I don't know. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I don't know, but it's also a fabulous place, it's just not Italy. And so the, uh, it is, this is based on what a lot of the NICU parents are given, Welcome to Holland, a book by um, Emily Kingsley. Uh, so probably because she wrote it. Anyway, uh, what kinds of things, if, if you imagined that, that this is what you're going to have and this is what you have, how, easily is it, how easy is it to bond with that child in that environment? Do you think it's really easy? No. And what about if you have other children? 
those children cannot even come in and see this baby until the baby is more stable. This could be months. And what I think people forget is that NICU houses a lot of babies, 80% of whom will come back home, and depending on which numbers, you're probably higher than that in many countries, but overall, 80% of which will come home and enter the family. So these are, not, these are not lost causes. These are your children. And you get them like this, and nobody makes that connection. So this is where we kind of see this kind of stuff playing out. So basically, I want you to not focus on the words. That's why I blocked them out. But this is a young lady who's finally able to hold her baby. She has a ton of wearables on her. And she must kangaroo before she can go home. So for three months, two months, she was living with this baby. And she was the stranger in, in Holland, expecting an Italy trip. And somehow, she's kind of getting a sense of the technology, the words, everything she's using. And she's kind of getting it. And then they're like, and now you go home. Like, what? Now I go home. Because home doesn't look like this. And home does, oh my god, what are we going to do with home? And so that's a whole other thing that happens. And that's really what, what's going on here. If we focus that mother, look at her face. That's not the face of a confident woman about to hold her baby. That's the face of a frightened young lady who's going to bring home a sci scientized baby that she didn't expect. And so this is kind of some more conversations about that. It's easy to feel as though your role as a parent is being taken from you when you're in the NICU with nurses tending uh, to your baby all around the clock, doctors calling all the shots. Once I let it be known that you know I wanted to know everything, I'm ready for it, suddenly they're able to show her. And still there's a moment of what? So I had my son born in similar circumstances. And I was actually happy that there was an induction period uh, and that there were people to help. And, uh, uh, but it was always very frightening and stuff in terms of doing things. But, uh, but more frightening would be, here you go, yeah. six hours oh, after delivery, good. right? Here you go. And she's got a bunch of wearables. Don't worry. There's a packet you can read at your leisure. Like, wait, what? Right, I could see that would be even more horrifying. The only thing more horrifying than living in NICU is just the, the going home raw. Well, what I was going with that was, was I wondered if men preferred the, the, the sanitization of it, if, 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 men, if, if men preferred, you know, uh, to, male engineers. Because, you know, in terms of, uh, <laughs> you know, or, or whether they, are, they, have, they, have, they have a greater capacity to accept it. <laughs> Well, I, I can't speak to that because we have really only been uh, talking with the five families and we've been embedded and seen uh, a few other families work it out. It does tend to be that the women are more upset about the um, scientized nature of that, but they're also the ones that learn it quicker. And they're also the ones that are, that are primarily, even if they weren't before, even with the case of stay-at-home dad, they are still the ones that, that learned it um, with more competency. And that, I don't think, is gender difference so much as how they were talked to inside the NICU. Mom is primary no matter what the situation is, which is uh, probably a, a cultural misunderstanding in some cases. Um, so basically what ends up happening here is that these um, doctors, mid-level practitioners, the families, they collaborate based on these wearables to come up with better procedures. So the baby is spitting up and that's causing some of this respiratory problem. So hey, why don't you feed them when, during the kangaroo stage of, of their existence? Why don't you do that? Um, well, it seems like when you feed them this based milk and then you feed them that, this is going on. So there's more monitoring and they're able to change the regimes. And these were things that the engineers may not have ever thought about, the, the way in which a, a baby um, lives their life. Or let's say this particular baby likes to lay on their side, but the technology doesn't allow for that. Then there's the sleeping patterns are poor. And then they try something, or like, oh, baby works better on left side. Then suddenly they're like, OK, change the monitors like this, do this. There's a lot more collaboration in this space. So some really good stuff is happening, a lot of um, saving and improving lives um, inside the NICU. And they're able to map out this understanding of the baby that's a little different. So um, this is a bioengineering professor at UCSD. And he said, as an added bonus, we're doing something to reduce the physical barriers between parents and their newborn babies in intensive care, which can only be beneficial. It was something he never considered until he started looking at how they're living these lives. So he was, it was like um, that, uh, 
song, All That Science, I Don't Understand, it's just my job five days a week. So suddenly it's like, wait a second, these people are living with these technologies. Oh my goodness, we had better fix this problem. And so that's where the collaboration comes into creating not just innovations in practice, but innovations in the products themselves. Um, here's some more stuff. I don't see the ventilator as equipment. I see it as the baby's lungs and the tubing. It's like the baby's extended trachea. This is the NICU staff member. And then there's the dad in this situation. And he's taking a video of the NICU space. And he's going, and then there's Sam. <laughs> it's like, Sam should be the focus of this video. But it's like, here's this monitor. And here's the NICU doctor. And, here's and then there's Sam. And Sam's like, you know, Sam is like ancillary to this, this process. And so he's trying to make sense of the machines, the alarms, the baby, the place. And you know, it's, it's all new and difficult for him. Here's an unexpected uh, collaborative innovation, and that's that doctors who were using this stabilizing wrist um, mechanism, which is used for, um, in the case of strokes in some people, some, um, sometimes athletes, uh, they use the stabilizing device so that they can better eat. Um, MS uses them as well. And doctors started using them in surgery because there's a lot of fatigue for this, uh, the very minute, fine uh, motor skills that they're doing. And they actually find that when they wear this, it enhances the surgery procedure, it reduces the operating times, and there's better patient outcomes. So they were able to say, by watching the people that I see with this brace on, I found another use for this brace actually inside the operating room. So cool stuff happening, unexpected collaborative space. So that leads to the kind of my conclusion before I get you guys to open up and tell me what everything you think, and that's that the Wii wearables make magic. That's, that's what I want you to, to think about. The wearable technology, it monitors the people in use. It's less invasive than medical testing. It's probably more accurate because it's showing exactly what's going on. The patients feel empowered and emplaced. Even, as you said, when you had a baby like that, you felt safer in that medical environment than you brought it home and suddenly it took another uh, trip to maybe Spain. <laughs> what, what is this? The fitness wearables, they inspire better um, compliance, better fitness regimes, better understanding of the body. And while the wearables are individual at the level of wearing them, they are collective in practice. And that's an, an example of, of one of those things when you hear the doctors talk, they are somewhat cognizant of the collective. When you interview the engineers, that was very different for them to imagine, that this isn't just the wearable on this one creature, but it's living in a social environment and we should be somewhat cognizant of that. And so I think some of this, um, when we collaborate, we're able to see what actually happens and improve these kinds of um, innovations and uh, success. So that's what I have. Where are my questions? Mm -hmm. Yes. Fascinating talk, a uh, very, very cool space. Um, would you mind putting back to where the interviews uh, that you did in all your data gathering? Um, I'm interested in um, how much uh, um, the benefits seem to be from the community that you talk to in gathering lots and lots of quantitative data, real time, longitudinal, that they could use to help diagnosis with the with the uh, specialist versus um, what might be actually monitoring. So in the case of you know a, a a preemie baby with a lot of health issues, is it more the monitoring when they come at home that so the at the real time and, and if so, how does the hospital interact with that to be able to be, you know, uh, reacting in a timely way, or is it more the data gathering and the trends and and the richness of that? Um, that's a very good question, and what I would say is that we actually went into places that would let us in, that were considering this kind of monitoring space, so it is skewed only to those people who are interested in collaborating. Um, so I, it, it's a, we were on the cutting edge of things, the grant work is, it's based on some grant work, and basically, um, it is not just the monitoring, but this conversation. So the one doctor that said, uh, well, they're collecting and they're, they're diarying, he actually can't monitor this. So he has a lot of mid-level people who monitor and then they meet as the, the 12 minutes, if you will, that they spend is the patient or patient advocate and the people who have done, the two people in this case, that's two that do the monitoring and then the doctor comes in. So there's 12 minutes, his 12 minutes is with a committee and it's collaborative in that sense, and they're finding huge success over the people who didn't adopt this collaborative space. 
um, but then I don't have that kind of data yet. What we're working on is IRB to, um, there's a particular um, recording device that every 12 <coughs> seconds it records uh, a snippet of conversation and we are trying to get approval to do that. Um, my grad student uh, Beth has been taking a study in it and so basically uh, she's been learning over the last year how to um, interpret. It's, it's snippets so that's the sanitized part. You can't tell the names of people and whatnot. Just the kinds of ways in which what we're interested in is the ways in which the language becomes more scientized and then of course more real, more uh, real person. And so in the beginning of the recordings that we hear, it's all these words and acronyms. Then there's the explaining of the words and acronyms and then over time the parents are adopting some of this language and then the nurses are calling, oh mother, here's your baby. So the conversations about family occur. And what we're interested in is when these big shifts and how long does it usually take. And so um, we are trying to gear up for a more quantitative analysis. We, um, which is not to say that qualitative research requires that, but in this case, we're trying to figure out how widespread it is. So that's, that's, that's a great question. I was wondering in these settings about the role of um, patient advocates and um, patient coaches and those sort of intermediary roles and whether in these settings, um, in addition to being more willing to try out the technology, whether they're also making more use of those uh, kinds of intermediaries. They are. So in the, um, in the communities that we were with, they, they were allowing the mid-level people, they could be the respiratory therapist, they were um, the parent coach, the breastfeeding coach, some of these people were allowed in that space. And again, we were just not talking to doctors who did the more traditional medicine. Um, we also looked at the IT, the integrative touch. Um, those are doctors, mid-level practitioners. There's also people who are um, uh, involved in like teaching children to play with horses and animals and how this affects things. And so we're really looking at the, the bleeding edge of that community. Um, but my, um, my husband has a lot of data. Um, he works in the medical, he's in finance now, but uh, he was an actuary. And so he was able to liberate from a lot of friends sort of the, um, <laughs> the data, the raw data in our area of Tucson and in Finland about um, what are the usual outcomes, statistically speaking. And so we can kind of see that, but we ha need a, a much larger. This is uh, very small in comparison to where we're going with it. Yeah. Yes? So I, I have a question. So it was a great talk. and. Um, you know, I think it, I like what's behind it in terms of the lead and the collaboration. I just wonder if you can speak to, you know, how we can get better at doing this. It seems some of the examples are grassroots and, yeah. and then, and yet you've been involved with some things that are, I guess, top down in terms of some of the innovative, uh, you know, collaborative um, insurance and yeah. Harlem. Can you speak to, like, how we can, get better at doing this so we can get more innovations? Uh, we get to... Okay, so, you know, um, in my, what was it, impassioned, what did we call that? Um, engaged engaged scholar. academics, yes. Yeah. Engaged scholar, um, which I'm going to use now that I got it. I'm going to use this all the time. Uh, my first thing would be that we really need to step away from this pr primacy of science and that the doctor, we, we, um, it's, we give, shroud them in this, scientism and we forget the art that's behind that. Some doctors, although they are educated and although they have the same patient load, they do not make the decisions that lead to successful outcomes and some do. And sometimes it's based on gut and instinct and whatnot. So we need to kind of remember that and then imagine that if we had better data and if we talked together, then 12 minutes would not be 12 minutes of guessing, but it would be 12 minutes of actually looking at this. So I would, it would mean that we have to imagine that the doctors don't have all the knowledge. And I think, like I will say, um, my mother is in part of the study as a, stri a stroke survivor, and she it was, is a nurse. She's not practicing now, but um, her belief that the doctor is always right is ridiculous. It is ridiculous. I, I hate to say that, but um, she's a super smart lady. All my life, I've, I've uh, always had the utmost respect for my mom. She's awesome. Um, and yet, she yields to this because she grew up in a time when doctors said something and you did it. And your failure to comply is your failure, 
not their failure to give you a regime that makes sense. So I think we need to kind of question that, and there are a lot of people doing it, so we just kind of need to step into that space. So the top down, we have to just kind of take that, take that magic and imagine that it's everybody's magic, not just their magic. And I think that's the first thing. The first step is not just advocacy, because actually the internet gives people just enough information to be dangerous if you will. They come in and they're like, you know, I want the purple pill because the, the TV said I need to have the purple pill. Well, are you experiencing these symptoms? No. Then why do you need the purple pill? Because I need it because they said it on TV. You know, there's all sorts of that happening. Um, and then there's, uh, you might have met them. There are people who look online and they disease shop. Do you, do you know any people who do this? Like, they, they don't feel well. And um, <laughs> I have a colleague who does this. And he always thinks that he has whatever, like Ebola or whatever. And you're like talking to him, you're like, well, why do you think that? And then he sort of gives a couple, and he's super smart, okay. But he starts reading a little, and then you'd be surprised. If you start reading the things, you, start, you do start thinking that you have that. Like the more you're sitting there like, I do have whatever. What is that, um, the one that where you're, you have chronic pain? Oh, fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia. There's, oh, if, if you talk about it long enough, we all have it. Okay, we are, every one of us is like, I have that from that. It's like, no, you don't. It's a thing. It's an actual thing, and we can decide whether you have it or not. Or if we think in terms of children um, in schools, a lot of, it's, it's popular to imagine that if your child is not behaving in class, then they have some kind of hyper behavioral issue, and um, it's not true. <laughs> so I, I think, um, I'm not advocating that we are always equal partners, but we should be some partners in there. And then as your expertise grows, then it becomes more equal. So that's the step one. Yep. Earlier in the presentation, you talked about uh, consumption and kind of group consumption. Consumption as we. Was that just a, an example to get us into the idea of uh, people utilizing things together? Were, were there kind of implications on consumption in terms of these technologies that you found? Well, so they sell all of these technologies, all of the Fitbit, all of these th technologies, all the wearables, the Google Glass, they sell as something that you individually use. But in reality, we use them all together. And if we think about it, even to the terms of shampoo, we imagine that we use shampoo alone in our bathroom, but we put it in a bathroom that is probably used by someone else, and they probably use this because I, we chose it. So I would argue that um, decisions that we make are almost inherently collective at some space. Like, so what we, you know, there is that. And I want to consider that these communities of practice, these practices that people engage in, whether it's families or friend groups or colleagues, they matter to the actual consumption that we choose. Um, so I, just to give you an example at, again, using my workplace, we have two people with um, celiac disease, and that's unusual to have two, uh, we are blessed. Um, or, or they are cursed, it's hard to say. Um, and that changes the way we have all kinds of events. Uh, it changes the way we treat food, but it also changes the way, what the time of day that we have them. It's easier to, to feed them breakfast and it's easier to feed them reception. So we tend not to have lunch and dinner. And it goes through these kinds of collaborative, collective, trying to imagine how everybody can be treated, that the consumption patterns change. Yeah, and, there's yeah. a very good example that you mentioned Netflix. Netflix, when it first yeah. started online, you know, it was customized viewing, so its offering was customization. And whoever opened the account would answer all the questions about favorite movies and genres of movies and everything else. So I would do it all, everything else, and so you'd say yes, you know, you know, um, Godfather 1, Godfather 2, Godfather 3, Sopranos, or everything else. And then, then they would say, well, this individual is schizophrenic because they're watching Downton Abbey, you know, uh, Pride and Prejudice, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so there it's about you. But, <laughs> and now they actually have collaborative modes, you, you know, they, they reveal yes. the identity because they, they didn't know that going in. They didn't know that it was, you know, they, didn't, they just you know, thought you were an account, your credit card was an individual consumer. But right. it's obviously collaborative consumption. And Netflix has really been out on the, on, on the forefront of that. Um, the gaming communities have been out there on the forefront. They understand that several gamers could have one uh, particular password and they have different personas. Even like the Wii games, the WI, uh, they have, uh, you can have your own little avatar yep. and you can make up to 12. So they can imagine that your space is, uh, is up to 12. And that changes the way, that changes the dynamics. I mean, I have, um, 
four children that lived in my home and three boys and one girl. And although on many things there's not a lot of gender effects, um, and I don't know if this is gender, she doesn't like kill games and the boys like kill games. And I mean like sniper, war, um, actually, they made, they made The Sims um, create an amusement park into a kill game. They did. So they would create these amusement parks and however many, the, the higher the death factor, the one that wins. Um, so it's just, you know, these boys will do what they do. I don't think they're, they're negative children, but they do that. My daughter plays only collaborative, positive games, but she's not feminine. She's never owned a doll. So she's not feminine in the sense, those of you who know her, she's, she's, uh, she's a child who welds. She's an architecture major. And if you tell her something's bumping in the car, she will take apart the car and she will weld it back together again. So she's not your pink Barbie girl. And yet she doesn't like any of these kill games. So she was able to play these games and they would parse out the sniper part of it. So she, there are some games that allow that. Like the Zelda games allow you to take out the violence. A couple of interesting questions that's brought up. First of all, the medical doctors you interviewed, how many of them were women that were using this, these technologies? Any of them? So, yeah, so there, in, in our sample, there's two men and two women. Well, that's yes. interesting. And it, it'd be interesting to see, you yes. know, it's that trend that you're noticing with your daughter, whether that's yeah. true with medical doctors or not. I, I, it's I, true. I, I, anecdotally, I've observed some of that. Yeah, and, and I'm four, you know, I can't say. Yeah, you know, no, no, sure. Of <laughs> but I'm talking about as you, as you grow yes. the study. And another yeah. thing I think would be really interesting would be to see how they choose and how they adapt what metrics are being measured, right? So the doctor at first says, okay, I'd like you to track this, this, I'd like you to, you know, I'd like you to do this sort of thing, and I'd like you to track these variables about your body, your vital stats. But it may be that the patient, in the model you're talking about, that we make magic, the patient notices something mm -hmm. about their symptoms, particularly in a complex case, right? And they think, they have a gut feel it might be important, and, and they would like to add that to their tracking. And we did see, it, we did see evidence of that in the small sample that we have. Um, some of the doctors were very interested on um, the baby's output, so we'll just call it output, yes, and sure. they wanted them to you know, measure the diaper before and measure the diaper after, and they were all about the output. It's a respiratory issue that they're having, so yes. we're not sure why. So some of the families, the five families, about um, we had three of them that actively pushed back, and we're not going to measure that. That's silly. I, I can't be measuring this diaper every place, and we don't know how relevant that is. Instead, we're going to measure whether they had uh, milk content or whether they had. So they started um, diarying about that, and then that's what they started tracking. So you're right. What they imagine. Um, what a doctor might imagine is super important. You know that organism from living with this child. Um, and I think we've all probably had this experience. When I, I had the, the, the little girl that now welds is the one that was in the NICU. And she is a, a child that had severe asthma. There are some ramifications of this. Um, she wore the monitoring devices for three years. So that's a pretty significant issue. And um, they kept treating her like she was uh, fragile and special. And she was not into that. And uh, they kept trying to tell us that um, she, would, she had a, a disturbing knack for getting pneumonia. And I would come in, and they would say, oh, this is bronchitis. Don't worry about it. And I'm like, look, I know in about seven days this is going to be pneumonia. They're totally different things. I don't know the science behind this, but please trust me. And you, know, you get a doctor, and they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And seven days later, we're back, and she's got pneumonia. And there's no way to explain to them, I understand these are different organisms, but in this organism that I call grace, this is what happens. And you know, we don't know why that is, nor do they know why that is. But sometimes the incumbent people in the lives of, of, of a particular person know this. And they know that um, she, uh, has a, she sees, seizes sometimes, even now, um, if she doesn't eat in specific times. So she's managed very well, and she's a super awesome kid. Uh, but she does have this little idiosyncratic behavior. So when she started going to university, I actually went down there and I'm like, I'm not a helicopter parent, but I would like to make sure that I can stock, I can, I'll buy a fridge and I'll stock it. And I think it's in everybody's best interest that we do this. And they're like, yeah, great. And then they saw her do it once. And that's, I, I'm going to tell you, that's, that's a defining moment when, when it becomes real. She's seizing and you're like, oh my god, if we had just given her a stick of string cheese, this may not have happened. Um, and so, it, you know, the whole world kind of kind of changes in what you monitor. And we were the ones that identified it was food. So, so that, that's, I mean, 
incredible story, but that's, that's also fascinating for, for implications for the larger sample, right? Yeah. And, 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 and maybe, maybe it, will, it will track with success of, of, of implementation either for a, a company or for uh, the adoption of a whole class of device in whether it has that ability for the user uh, to, uh, to feed back and change different you know, things that are monitored and, and have that be accepted in the medical system. Um, I, I will say that all six of the mid-level practitioners did begin our study telling us that they always listen to the family, they always make a house visit. At every house visit, they find out significant information that they wouldn't have found on a form. Uh, my mom has had a Braille Institute person come to her home, and that changed everything because things we had not told them, how far away she sits from things, they got to see that. Um, a problem that she has is, is getting the washer and dryer to work in their garage, and so they just made it so that it only goes to the two settings that she uses. Um, simple things like that, that you don't expect a mid-level practitioner to have come in and done that, but that's, um, they recognized that and came to visit. I wonder what would happen if the doctors came to visit. So, you know, you see on house that they do that, but in real life, they never do. And I bet if they did, they'd be like, well, no wonder you have this. There's a cat or something, you know, like some kind of, um, not to blame cats. But I think, I think you're right. And the more, I think the mid-level practitioners acknowledge that more than doctors in general do because they're closer to the patient. So thank you. These are all cool. Thanks. Thank you.